welcome to Dear Hank and John. Or as I prefer to think of it, Dear John and Hank. It's a comedy podcast where two brothers answer your questions, give you dubious advice, and bring you all the week's news from both Mars and AFC Wimbledon. John, what did the doctor say to the patient who wanted an appointment because they had become invisible? What? I'm sorry, I can't see you right now. <laughs> that's, that's, that's terrible. I'm sorry. That That is the worst one yet. It's, it, I, I don't love this bit, but I was willing to accept it until that one. <laughs> look, look, look. We did this on tour, and every dad joke got a huge, a huge round of applause from uh, the minority of the audience. But those people... <laughs> Well, Hank, I have a bit of good news for you. I All have right, a bit yeah. of good news. Robert Mueller is ready to deliver key no, findings no. in his Trump probe, say, sources after the is midterm that, elections. That's still... Ha oh. <laughs> well, that's good news. I, oh, God. This isn't what the good news segment is supposed to be for, John. It's funny. I had forgotten about the Mueller probe. Mueller probe, whatever it's called. I'd forgotten about it. It's just... It's too many other things happening. One of the great narratives of 2017 and 2018 life is that nobody knows how to pronounce Robert Mueller's last name. <laughs> <laughs> and this person who may or may not end up playing a pretty significant role in American history has an unpronounceable last name. He's like the guy who, who discovered Halley's Comet or who discovered that Halley's Comet was a repeating comet. Nobody knows how to say his name, which is why lots of people call Halley's Comet Halley's Comet. It's true. It's true. Except that I feel like we could just ask Robert M M Mueller. No, we can't. Unfortunately, he never responds to press inquiries. <laughs> <laughs> He's like the ah. J.D. Salinger of independent investigators. People have met him, though. He's introduced himself to people. Hi, I'm Robert Mueller. It, that reminds me that since I do know James Comey, I could perhaps use my connection to ask James Comey how Robert Mueller pronounces his last name. Um, I, I have in, do, 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 are you on email basis with James Comey? I thought you were about to say, are you on email? And I was going to be like, yeah, no, I mean, I've abandoned a lot of social media, but I have kept up with the email. Are you still on email, John? Yeah. Do, do you, do you email regularly with James Comey? No, no, of course not. Um, I asked that question just so that I can tell you that I do email somewhat semi-regularly with the governor of my state now. Do you really? I do. And he responds to me. And I'm just like, hey, I had this thought. I thought that it might be interesting for you. And he's like, yeah, I was talking about my to my daughter about that recently. Wow. And I'm like, I'm just chatting with the gov. I mean, I guess that is the benefit of living in a state with 800 residents. <laughs> yeah, man, you got to try it out. By the way, if you go to YouTube and you search Robert Mueller, it autofills saying his own name. So we're not the first person. <laughs> <laughs> we're not the first person to have this question. <clears throat> uh, what does it say? Uh, you know, there's a bunch of links that don't include Robert Mueller saying his own name. So pretty mm -hmm. typical YouTube search results. <laughs> Okay, Hank, let's go ahead and move on to some questions from our listeners. All right, this one comes from Liesel, who asks, Dear Hank and John, my roommate just caught a cold from me as I, re as I am recovering from that cold, and I would like to provide care for her in any way I can. That's very sweet. Unfortunately, the only thing I can think to do is cook, and I am not a very good cook. She does a lot of the cooking. You have a roommate that does a lot of the cooking? That's amazing. Wow. That's amazing. Wow. And she is very good at making soups, and I am not. Do you have any dubious advice for how to care for a sick roommate? Guilty and terrible at cooking, Liesel. Liesel, you don't have to be good at cooking to be able to cook soup. You need to be That's good true. at can opening. Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah. So, so a chicken noodle soup is so easy. So the, the, here's the main thing that I learned about how to make a chicken noodle soup, John. This is, this is an innovation that somebody should have told me that I had to learn on my own. Okay. You don't buy raw chicken. You buy a rotisserie chicken, and you take the cooked, juicy, amazing chicken that an expert made, and you cut it off of the chicken, and you put that in the soup. And then the chicken is good. Everything else is just like the stuff you put in the soup. 
it's just boiled noodles and stuff and like chicken stock and like opening cans and opening cardboard thingies because now that's Cutting when they put the carrots. chicken stock in. Yeah, no, yeah. it's pretty straightforward, Liesl, but I'm going to make it even a little easier and recommend that you purchase canned Campbell's soup. <laughs> you open the can. Oh, no, no. You put it in a bowl. You put the bowl in a microwave. You microwave it until it's an appropriate heat, and then you hand it to your roommate and your roommate is sick, all right? They, their, their taste buds are all jacked it's up. True. They can't yeah. smell anything. They're not going to know that it's not homemade soup, and they're not going to care because it, in this situation, it actually is the thought that counts because homemade chicken noodle soup does not make you well any faster than delicious Campbell's. Is it too early to have a sponsor? Campbell's <laughs> no, chicken noodle soup, the best I mean, soup that you can buy in a can. You just said that it's not the thought. It's the thought that counts. And I just think that there's more thought that goes into like, you know, ripping some flesh off of a, off of a pre-cooked nah, bird. No, no, no. The thought comes when you tell Instacart to bring you canned <laughs> chicken noodle soup as soon as possible for the lowest delivery fee that they can achieve. I don't know, even know what Instacart is. All you big city folks and your services, <laughs> service apps. <laughs> do you guys have Uber or has Uber not come to Montana yet? We do. We we got Uber uh, last year um, and we also have Lyft. And uh, yeah, it's great. I'm very glad. I just used it just the other day because we took the bus to the mall and then the bus stopped uh, running while we were in the mall. And we had to take an Uber home. <laughs> Welcome to Montana. This next question comes from Katie, who writes, Dear John and Hank, I took a midterm this morning, and the last question was extra credit. The professor posed the following riddle. A man walks past a hotel and laughs. Why? Mm. I was completely stumped. Google doesn't seem to have the answer either. Can either of you think of anything? It's driving me insane. Aye, aye, matey. Katie. I think it was just a funny hotel. Oh, no, I think that it's a riddle. Um, right. It's a riddle about how how different architecture... Like, so the guy is an expert in architecture, and he noticed that the hotel was built in the 1990s, but attempted to be in an Art Deco style, but got a lot of the fundamentals of Art Deco wrong, and he thought that was funny. Uh, I don't think that's it. They're playing Monopoly. He's playing Monopoly. He went past the hotel and he was like, haha, I don't have to pay. That's He's what it is. That's the answer. He's playing Monopoly. He's playing Monopoly. He's playing Monopoly. I've heard a version he, of that of that riddle before, one that makes much more sense. The version the, I've heard uh, is well, I, the version a man I've heard pushes, is he size size uh, yeah, he pushes a wheelbarrow he past the hotel. Pushes a wheelbarrow past a hotel and laughs. And that makes sense. That is a good riddle because it's like, oh, the whole thing came together. Right, but there is no Monopoly piece that's a man walking. No. No. No, that is Boo. a... I, first off, you need to go back and you need to criticize the riddle. That'll get you extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> I am a riddle expert. Hello. Uh, in addition in addition to uh, being very good at taking your test, I am also a riddle expert. And... That is that is what I've been studying. It's my side my st side study hustle. Do people have those? That's a good idea. We should have those. We should have yeah, side they're studies. Called, yeah, no, they're called minors. No, oh. so that's yeah, minoring and riddle expertise. Right. And this was bad. You did this incorrectly, professor, and I judge you. It's more like a man pushes a top hat past a hotel and exhales with relief. I don't feel like you <laughs> laugh. Like when you're playing Monopoly and you don't land on a hotel, you're not like ha ha. You're like, well, I made mean, it past that if, hotel. If it's very close to the end of the game, like you roll and it's like, oh God, that was a that was a an eleven. That's hard to do the math. Let's see where I'm gonna end up. And then you get one past the hotel, and that's the whole thing that that makes that turns the game and you're like, ha ha <laughs> No, I don't no, only terrible people laugh in that situation. I think you laugh in that situation. No, it's not like a Mr. Burns moment where you're like, oh, I don't have to pay you off. Like you're just you're relieved and right. you've won this awful board game. Maybe the worst board game of all time. A man walks a dog past a hotel and then makes the noise of, I can't believe I'm still playing this game in an era of so many actually good board games. Yeah, it's like, whatever. why is this happening? Why did I, mean, I go to visit my in-laws? And why 
are we doing this? Also, the other thing that you're probably thinking is, oh my God, I can't believe I'm playing the Missoula, Montana version of Monopoly, <laughs> where all of the streets are named after streets in my hometown of 1,100 people. Oh my God, how did my life come to this? That is the noise that you're making, not right. laughter. <laughs> there are 60,000 people in this town, John. It's the big city. There's no way that there are 60,000 people in Missoula. You guys are counting the cows. Dear Hank and John, I have just watched Hank's most recent Instagram story in which he is showing, quote, real-time fall as some fall, as some leaves fall from some trees. It was really weird. It's like I woke up that morning and it was just like a cascade. Every tree was like, I'm done with this. These are terrible. However, Natalie says... It appears that he is in a car, and I wanted to send him a Snappy the T-Rex to remind him that snapping and driving is dangerous, but then I realized that it wasn't technically a Snapchat. Does Snappy the T-Rex apply to Instagram stories too, or is there another lovable dinosaur who wants to keep you off of social media while driving? Dates and dinosaurs, Natalie. Natalie, I apologize. You're right. I should not have been doing that. Distracted driving is a huge cause of injury and death. And it is not just the person who is doing it. It is also the people that they hit with their cars. And even if I'm stopped at a stoplight, I still am in charge of this very powerful machine and need to be concentrating on that. And uh, so I, you are right. And you should send me some kind of dinosaur. Obviously not Snappy the T-Rex. John, do you have like, so Instagram, E, no. Grammy? Is it Grammy? Is that what we're going to go with? God, Instagram is a terrible name for a platform. Oh, I think that they've been doing all right. (laughs) It's true, but I I think it's despite the name. There are some dinosaurs that start with a G. Um, Yeah. So like Grammy the Gargoyosaurus, a pretty cool name for a dinosaur. Hank, correct me if I'm wrong, but don't you call a professional Instagram user a grammar? Is or do you, you call them a Grammy? I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> no, because it's Snappy. I'm. I'm going off Snappy. Snappy is oh. a T-Rex. Oh, I. Oh, I guess that's my first confusion. I thought people who are professional Snapchatters are called Snappies. <laughs> are they not? They. Of course they are, John. You are great. correct. Well, I think it's great that so many young people out there are making a living as Snappies. <laughs> <laughs> I am not at all freaked out by this world in which I find myself, where people are professional snappies and Grammys and grammars. And <laughs> it's great. There's, yeah. Kelsey Grammar. Kelsey Grammar is a professional. He was the first grammar. He was the first grammar, but now there are thousands of them. There's van life grammars. There's grammars who pretend that they're in romantic relationships that they're not actually in. There's, oh, there's so many different kinds of grammars out there. It's wonderful. I'm, I love it. I'm not at all freaked out. I'm going to propose Grammy the Gorgosaurus. Mmm, Grammy the Gorgosaurus. What about Grammy the Gobisaurus? I mean, a Gobisaurus is a pretty good dinosaur, but as I recall, don't, don't Gobisauri look like squat and unintimidating, whereas a Gorgosaurus is basically like a miniature T-Rex. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a pretty that's pretty serious looking looking little guy. I don't know how big they are, uh, but th- I wouldn't want to mess with one. What about uh, Gr- Grammy the Guanalong? What about Grammy the Guanlong? I mean, that's good. It's just not as good as Gorgosaurus. I already found the best one. We just need to accept it and move on. <laughs> it's Grammy the Gorgosaurus, your professional Instagram dinosaur that is here to remind you that it is not a good idea to use Instagram stories while you are driving and arguably not a good idea to use Instagram stories. I'm looking at how big a Gorgosaurus is and it could definitely eat my, at least my top half in one bite. My only concern is that is a Gorgosaurus the exact same as a Tyrannosaurus Rex or are they just very similar? They're just very similar. Okay. All right, Hank, we have another question and it's of great interest to me. It's from Allison. She writes, Dear John and Hank, recently I have found myself wondering where I should look when I am talking to someone. I know people always say that you should look into the other person's eyes, but I always feel like after a few seconds of doing that, it's pretty weird and I have to look away. Also, I feel that the eyes aren't doing that much while a person is talking as compared to the other parts of their face. So my eyes naturally want to drift to where there is more movement. You can call me Allison. It's good. It's a uh, it's a Paul Simon good. joke. Yeah. Um, I think that this is an example of a thing that as soon as you think about it, is it is impossible. 
I if I'm thinking about where to look while I'm talking to someone, I immediately cannot tell what they are saying. I have no idea what's happening. I lose it all, and I become a ve- of non a non human. Basically, I lose the ability to communicate. Hank, I think that you're actually pretty good at looking in appropriate places when you're in conversations with people. It's something that has always impressed me because I am really <laughs> bad at it. Um, like I do, I really struggle with eye contact. It feels super weird and intimate to me to engage in any kind of eye contact. Like I'm discussing a, a, the budget for a home renovation or, or something and the way <laughs> that I am being looked at and the way that like social norms are telling me to look back is to me equivalent to like the way you look at someone while you are making your wedding vows. Like <laughs> the only time I have engaged in what I consider like the only time in my life I have chosen to engage in the eye contact that society seems to feel is totally normal is while I was getting married. I don't know. I, I definitely there was a time in my life where when I actually had a tutor who helped me with that because I was not good at eye contact and uh, and was, yeah, and sort of was like, this is maybe going to be a thing that takes practice for you. But now it's not a thing that, that I, I, unless I'm thinking about it, it's not a problem. And I think I do look around. I look around people's faces. Like when they do eye tracking studies, your, your, your eyes spend time on eyes, you, but like a lot of time is spent on lips. And then there's also time spent not looking at the face at all, like especially when like considering a response. Um, or thinking of on your own, and and so like the, the, your eyes do move around. I just think that the, like the the when it becomes very hard is when you're thinking about it at all, and that's that's I think what I what I have a problem with what, in those moments when I'm like, oh, what am I? What should I? Am I doing? Am I? Wait, oh, ooh, and then suddenly. I don't even know what's being said and also lose the ability to speak. Yeah, Allison, I would just say that you're not alone in this and don't really worry about where you're looking. It's fine. Yeah, yeah don't d- try not to worry about it and try not to think about it. Of course, it is the hardest thing in the world to not think about something, especially when your favorite podcasters are, have spent a lot of time talking about it. So we may have done more harm than good here, John. Probably so. As to be fair, we usually do. It does remind me, however, of a game that my daughter has been playing recently where I will be uh, in my little office in our house working and Alice will open the door, just lean her head in and then shout, monkey. Are you thinking about a monkey? Mm. <laughs> it's her It's her attempt to like control other people's thoughts. <laughs> I like it. Oh, that's it's that good. is all. That's what we're all doing, John. It's, good. it's very in, hard in not to think about another. a monkey when somebody mm-hmm. screams "monkey" at you. So now we have made a lot of people think about eye contact when that is the last thing that they should be doing. Okay, let's move on to another question. This one comes from Karina, who asks, "Dear Hank and John, after war, disease, solar flares, and climate change have killed us all, mm-hmm. do you think aliens will visit Earth and ride our roller coasters? I hope they do. A thing with feathers, Karina. Karina, are you a bird?" No, she's just... hope. She's hope, Hank. Hope is the okay. thing with feathers that perches okay. in the soul, etc. Right. But also birds have feathers. Indeed, that, that is, I think, the comparison that Emily Dickinson was attempting to make. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, I hope so. I just wanted to read that question because uh, it sounds like fun. I, I imagine that a lot of the roller coasters won't make it through, but they are built sturdily, like for obvious reasons. So maybe they will. I went to an abandoned theme park outside of Berlin once for a TV show shoot in which uh, like a German TV show was making, uh, you know, a piece about me in which I was Mm -hmm. supposed to be the kind of person who goes to abandoned (laughs) theme parks. And there were many things that were extremely weird about this abandoned theme park and and beautiful in their way but by far the weirdest thing i actually made a vlogbrothers video about this was this ferris wheel that spun on its own in the wind oh yeah i remember that and anyway i then later learned that people get on this ferris wheel that does not work and has not worked in decades And then they count on the wind to blow them all the way around. Mm -hmm. Which to me 
is way scarier than like getting on a spaceship mm-hmm. and going to Mars oh. <laughs> because there is a very good chance that you will be blown into a place th- that you are then stuck there for hours or days or weeks or the I, how what are you thinking did your did cell phones work was it a cell phony place because if it's cell phones work I think I'm fine with that I first off I don't know if cell phones worked because you know, I'm not going to pay 10 bucks a day for an international plan. <laughs> uh, this is in 2008, Hank. Okay. Oh, Pre, mm-hmm. Pre-fault in our stars. I was a different person. <laughs> so who knows? Secondly, uh, it's more depending upon equipment that has not been maintained mm-hmm. in decades and being like, oh, no, this will be fine. The wind will blow us in a circle. I don't know. So far, so good. I love the idea of aliens finding Earth like long after we're gone and trying to piece together what the heck we were up to. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, like they like like if they see a roller coaster and they're like, were these people trying to be afraid? A roller coaster is a really interesting example of like an amusement because most amusements are like digital or ephemeral or like based in in media, like music and and like even if you're going to see live music, like that's a thing that only exists in that moment. Whereas a roller coaster is a structure of amusement. And and so like it's a it's a thing that lasts and is there as a like Yeah. As a as and, and like even if it gets buried in the sands of time, like it it'll still be there unless, you know, the the whole earth turns to magma. So there's like this this record of like our fun. And here's what fun was like for at least some of us, though, to be clear, not all of us. But who knows if they would even know that it is a record of fun. Like, maybe they would look at it and be like, well, that is a skeleton of a weird creature. Or look at it and be like, wow, they must have had made babies in a really weird way. (laughs) Because that's that's what we always think, what scientists always think when they find some weird structure on an old animal. It's like, well, I guess that's just sexual dimorphism then. Right. It's weird. Right. That's just sexual selection. Yeah. Uh, that they're, they're like, wow. I guess they needed that <laughs> for some <laughs> reason. <laughs> or they'll think it was like a religious or some kind of ritual right. thing, like we do uh-huh. with Stonehenge, where they'll be like, Phew, I mean, I guess their gods were all uh, twisty and turny. Some upside down <laughs> gods. They had everything. <laughs> And then if they like refurbish it and like figure it all out, one one scientist will be like, no, no, no. It was just for being like weird and like getting looped a looped on and because they liked it. And all the other scientists will be like, you crazy, man. That That is not a thing. That's what I love about true crime podcasts. They always imagine these like immensely complicated theories and conspiracies. And then it turns out that it was just some Yahoo who's still sitting there in town, like on his front porch. The cops come over and they're like, hey, did you kill that person? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> turns out we just like to be upside down some. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> Sometimes the weirdest answer is, in fact, the answer. All right, Hank, this next question comes from Maud, who writes, Dear John and Hank, I take the bus to work every day, and I was wondering what the proper etiquette is when you are alone at a bus stop and a bus drives by that you do not want to take. Should I look away and act like I'm not there, or should I shake my (laughs) head at the driver to tell them I don't want to get in? Please help make my commute a little less awkward. At the bus stop, I don't want to stand out. Maud. I love the idea that you could just be like, no, don't look at me. Don't. I'm not here. I'm not. I won't make eye contact. I become invisible. Right. Like the ostrich sticking their head in the sand. Yeah. That's what you got to do, Maude. Just dig a hole. Yeah. (laughs) Get put your whole body in the hole and then come out when your bus is there. Maude, I think you're missing the obvious answer here, which is to have a sandwich board uh, that has (laughs) on one side, you are not my bus. And on the other yeah. side, you are my bus. And so you just turn your back to the bus and show them the you are not my bus sign when they are not your bus. Or that's your shirt. <gasps> Hank, that is so much better. You've solved the problem. <laughs> Maud. you're going to wear one shirt for the rest of your life. On one side, it says you are my bus. 
<laughs> and then on the back side, it says, you are not my bus. And you just turn around when you see the bus that is not yours and you watch it drive past you. And you'll probably even get a wave in the rear view mirror because the driver will be so delighted. And then when it is your bus, you get to stare at the bus as it comes and wave hello. And they'll know because it's right there on, on your shirt. You are my bus. You are my bus. You are my bus. <laughs> I, I, I mean, yeah. You just, I, I just wave the bus along. I'm like, you're not my bus. Go along. That, that is actually what I do too, and uh, it is super embarrassing now that I think about it. That like, I basically, you know, the the like traffic cop move along yeah. symbol. Yeah, that's the thing that I do. But I do it oftentimes like with the traffic cop level of drama. <laughs> where I'm like, keep it going, keep it going. It's not me. Don't slow down. Don't touch those brakes. You need to go, go, go. I know you got people to pick up, and I am not one of them. You go, you go, you go. And, I'm, and then the bus driver, it has only just occurred to me that the bus driver must be like, yeah, no, I got it. <laughs> yeah, I, I am a bus driver. I understand it took minimal input for me to understand that y you're not my guy. Which reminds me that this podcast is brought to you by John's overabundance of enthusiasm at only one particular moment of his public life. At <laughs> bus stops. <laughs> Today's podcast is also brought to you by Delicious Campbell's Chicken Noodle Soup. It's in a can. It's done. It's ready. This podcast is also brought to you by Bad Riddles. Bad Riddles. All you had to do was add a wheelbarrow to that thing. And also this podcast is sponsored by Grammy the Gorgosaurus. Grammy the Gorgosaurus. Just don't <laughs> use your phone while you're driving. I'm sorry. I appreciate your apology, but the apology that I want is changed behavior. This next question comes from Cyrus, John, and Cyrus asks, Dear Hanga John, recently I went to a friend's house and she started emptying her dishwasher, so I offered to help, but she said that it was fine, so I didn't help her and instead just stood there awkwardly in her living room and watched her for a few minutes. Oh, man. Should I have helped her anyway? When I have people over, is it okay to enlist guests to help if they offer? Pumpkins and penguins, Cyrus. Oh, C Cyrus. Cyrus, I think you missed a cue. Yeah. You were supposed to leave. <laughs> when somebody uh, opens their dishwasher and starts emptying the dishwasher or doing the dishes, unless there is like a firm commitment, like when I'm done with this, we're going to watch the Grammys or something. <laughs> that's when you have to leave. Talk about the Grammy the Gorgosauruses or? Yeah. No, Grammy the Gorgosaurus is exciting new special on Netflix. It's all about <laughs> why do we even use Instagram stories? Can't we just experience I f I'm old. I'm sorry, Hank. I, I will stop being anti-social media when social media stops sucking. Uh, <laughs> Cyrus, I think it was a cue to leave. That's my it may guess. Have been. Usually when I see like a, fr like a, I'm over at somebody's place and they start doing chores. I'm yep. like, unless, unless, yes. And, and, and in the case where there's like something else that's going to happen, then if they say they don't want to help unload the dishwasher, I assume that they have a system for that. And that is when I don't just stand there awkwardly, I get my phone out and I look at Instagram stories. Oh, God. Because, like, that's what we have phones for. That's the whole point is that in any awkward situation, I can always be like, oh, I will just look at my phone. That is, no, that is exactly what they do, Hank. They distract you so that you don't have to feel bored, so that for the rest of your life, you can feel, uh, instead of having to feel various feelings, you can just feel distraction yeah as for whether it's okay to enlist people to do chores at your house i totally think it is although it it can't be like just chores like it can't be like why don't you come over and do the dishes with me <laughs> yeah no it has to yeah. be like one thing among several things like why don't we do yeah. the dishes and then watch the grammys why am i so interested in the grammys <laughs> i actually I, 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 I haven't even seen the grammys in at least 20 years I had to think pretty hard to figure out what the Grammys were. Right. Like, I often mix truth. up the Grammys and the Tonys, even though they're about very different things. I mean, I guess yeah. they, they both involve songs sometimes. I actually, yeah, I get I get mixed up between the Grammys and the Emmys because they sound very similar. And I, I'm like, why well, can't... The big difference is that you have an Emmy. Yeah, you'd think that I would have some more understanding of it. And yet... All right, this next question comes from Carly, who asks, Dear John and Hank, I have an older brother, and we get along quite well. We send each other memes, watch YouTube together. We even occasionally carpool to work when our schedule 
schedules line up. As much as I love this, I wish there was something we could do together to bring our sibling bonding time to the next level. Hmm. Hank and John have what seems like a great sibling connection. Yeah, it's all for the show. <laughs> and spend quality time together by having a YouTube channel together and a podcast. Any advice on some good activities my brother and I could do together to bring us closer together? Pumpkins and penguins. Carly. You gotta make a shelf. Uh, that's actually not a bad idea. Make a shelf together. Like, learn some basic carpentry together. Here's, here's the secret. And I think you'll agree with me about this, Hank. It doesn't matter what the quest is. You just have to go on a quest together. Like, Hank and I were not that close when, in 2006, we decided that we were going to do Brotherhood 2.0. And we are close now because we went on this quest together. Ultimately, like, the fact that it ended up becoming a job and led to all kinds of opportunities we never could have imagined is wonderful. But it worked because Hank and I accomplished what we wanted to accomplish, which is that we became closer together. Like, I don't think it matters if you build a car together or if you build a shelf together or if you, I don't know why I can only think of built, if you record an album together that goes on to win a Grammy. I don't <laughs> think it matters what the quest is. You just go on a quest, go on a road trip, hitchhike around the circumference of Ireland with a refrigerator, uh, which is one of... That's one of my favorite uh, books. It's called Round Ireland with a Fridge. It's about a person who hitchhikes around the circumference of Ireland with a refrigerator. Okay. It's very funny. I think the trick is that the hard part of this is trying to find something that is a shared project that feels valuable. And and I, it's very hard to to like to just have the relationship without having... And this is dumb. It shouldn't be. It's, this, is, this is irrational, and it's not how it should be. But... If you can't like instill the value and believe in like the like the importance of the thing that you're doing, like we're making something that's beautiful or that's functional or we are, you know, like it it, it almost has to be about more than just the relationship. The good news is that there's right. lots of valuable things that can be created and, uh, and and that value can take lots of different forms. So it, it just has to be something that you both agree is valuable and that can be hard to find sometimes, but it's worth searching for. Make a shelf. Make a shelf. Shelves have value. What What are those, Hank? What are those cars that are also uh, pickup trucks? Um. Uh, oh. You live in Montana. Yeah. Well, we don't actually have a lot. Of are those. they El Caminos? Yeah, El Camino. Rebuild an El Camino together. Just uh, yeah. Get a rundown El Camino and then turn it into a sparkling, beautiful El Camino. Yeah. Search the the transcripts of old old space missions to find the best quotes is something that I've been doing lately. It's really fun. Oh, and then turn them into an animated YouTube series. Sure. Actually, that's ours. You can't have that. You can't have that idea. <laughs> that is our idea, and it is really, really good. <laughs> uh, okay, actually, that's really that, good. <laughs> that's a pretty good idea, Hank. You're f welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do something that um, won't in any way compete with any of the things that we do because we don't we we can't we can't have any competition. <laughs> this next question comes from Kyla, who asks, "Dear Hank and John, I was last year fortunate enough to buy the last signed copies of Turtle All, Turtles All the Way Down from my local bookstore. However, to this day, my mom still does not believe that John actually signed the book and says that there was a no way a person could or would sign that many individual books. Help me convince her it's real pumpkins and penguins, Kyla. I got it. I know how to like explain this, John, if you, if you are okay with me taking this one. Yeah, you can take it. I, I, I'll probably want to add something at the end. But yeah, how did I do it? Two things. John Green likes repetitive tasks. It's yep. it is a, a form of therapy for him, and that is why he has signed more books than maybe anybody. Two, John Green did not sign each individual book. He signed pieces of paper, and then they bound those pieces of paper into the book. There is no way we would tell you that that's how it worked because it actually lessens the impact if we were lying about the fact that he signed them at all. So if we were going to lie, we'd say that he signed each individual book, but that's not practical and so that's not what he did he signed lots of individual pieces and i did this too and then they put the pieces of paper into the book and if, like if we were going to lie why would we why would we tell that more complicated version of the story yeah i've been thinking about this because i've been reading marcus zuzak's book bridge of clay which is really really good it's his first book since the book thief and obviously a tremendous amount of work went into it over the last 13 years and you can tell it is a special book but 
he signed, I think, 120 or 130,000 tip-in sheets, which is almost as many as I signed for The Fault in Our Stars. I think that what interested me about it and what still kind of interests me about it is that it it is an attempt to physicalize in some small way this big thing that as as the thing got bigger, it it some it in some ways felt less intimate and it felt less like I was able to tell individual readers how grateful I was. And this was a small way that I could do that. And so it didn't really feel like work to me. Also, I mean, it isn't work. Like you spend 10 weeks sitting in your basement watching Netflix 40 hours a week. It was lovely. (laughs) (laughs) I couldn't do it while watching much TV. I did listen to a lot of podcasts, but I felt. I mean, I, I, I listened to that, all of. Yeah, I listened to all of Moby Dick. Oh which wow, it's perfect. Yeah, I, f- I found that watching TV slowed me down, and that was the lo- the one thing that I could not let happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, but I mean, you had to do it while you were doing all of your other jobs. Like you had to do it on the weekends. Like I fully, like I put in my calendar six hours a day, sit in your basement signing your name. It was lovely. I had a great time. Oh, okay, Hank, before we get to the all-important news from Mars and AFC Wimbledon, I just want to read a few responses that we received. This first one uh, from Annie and many other people who let us know that there are corn mazes outside of the United States. For instance, Annie is in New Zealand where there is a corn maze in the United Kingdom. They have them. But what I found fascinating is that almost everywhere outside of the United States seems to call corn mazes maze mazes, which is, of course, much better. (laughs) Why not do that? Why not? How how did we lose that opportunity? I don't know. Uh, secondly, we have a response from Kelsey who wrote in on the subject of raisins to say, my great aunt Dorothy, which sounds like a made up thing, but I'm going to assume that Kelsey's being honest. <laughs> my great aunt Dorothy says that raisins should never be added to a baked good because they shouldn't have to give their life twice. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Which I just thought was great. What? what? I just... How? I don't understand that. <laughs> because they died to become raisins. They were grapes and uh-huh. then they were shriveled. And then now they have to die again getting baked into some baked good. I love it, Great Aunt Dorothy. I don't need you to explain yourself. I'm in. Yeah. I'm in, Great Aunt Dorothy. I'm never putting a raisin in a baked good again. Lastly, Hank, from Taryn. Taryn wrote in to say, I have owned and competitively shown many horses since I was seven. Many? Not many. Many. Small. Yeah, miniature miniature horses, Hank. Uh, pros call them mini horses. <laughs> and we are we are now pros because we mentioned miniature horses in a podcast and now I've read 400 emails about them. Uh, I've loved listening to y'all discover how adorable they are. I definitely agree myself. In fact, I keep meaning to write in and suggest them as a topic for the Anthropocene Reviewed because of their awesomeness, but now I'm afraid it'll be weird. Anyway, I have now renamed two of my horses... John and Hank in honor of y'all. They're retired and they ignore me when I say their old names anyway. They're actually brothers. Oh. The older one is brown and black and here is a picture of them. I thought y'all might like to know. Minis all day, every day. Taryn. And there are, I mean, Taryn, this is the oh, best man. photograph. We'll put it on the Patreon at patreon.com slash Dear Hank and John. You don't have to pay to see it or anything. But it is the best picture of mini horses I've ever seen. And I have to say... I prefer. I assume that I am the older horse, yep. the brown one. Mm-hmm. I mean, I look almost exactly like that horse, and you look almost exactly like your horse. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do look. I, I, if I was going to say which one was me, I would definitely be Hank. Uh, and I agree. And I also feel like Hank's a little more carefree. He's having a bit more fun. He, his hair yeah. has a lot going yeah. on. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I I would say that John. I would say that John's deeper. Yeah, maybe a little more concerned about everything. Thoughtful. Yeah. I would say more careful. <laughs> oh. so you're, uh, you, you only attach negative uh, adjectives <laughs> to me. I would say thoughtful, <laughs> introspective, <laughs> cautious, caring. Oh, okay. I would say that John looks to me the more empathetic horse. Yeah. Uh, okay, sure. Whereas I would say that Hank looks a little reckless, <laughs> if I'm being frank. Hank looks like he likes to take all kinds of chances. Hank looks like the kind of mini horse who will start any business. Whereas John looks like a mini horse who needs to be convinced that something is a good idea and go about it in a careful and systematic way. He looks like that horse maybe started one too many businesses. 
<laughs> That's how I feel about that horse. Oof. That looks like a horse that struggles to get eight hours of sleep every night, whereas my horse, I'm good, man. All right, John. Well, in news from Mars, I got a little bit of an update on opportunity. Nobody's giving up yet. Okay. So uh, this has been a, a bad uh, a bad couple of weeks in uh, space, John, uh, unrelated mm-hmm. to Mars and opportunity. We had a Soyuz mission uh, that was taking two astronauts up to, or an astronaut, a cosmonaut up to the ISS. Uh, the rocket failed and they had to re-enter uh, they were safe, but like we don't know exactly what the problem was, so they did not make it to the space station, which is bad. We also had two um, malfunctions on space telescopes, both Hubble and Chandra, which uh, looks like we are, have fixed both of those things, but it's never good when you have malfunctions and things that you cannot fix because they're in space. And then, of course, we have uh, Opportunity, which has been very quiet. So one thing that, that we actually, one of the reasons why we thought that Opportunity might have a really short mission on Mars. And one of the reasons why this 14-year mission has been so exceptional and like so long is because we thought that that uh, dust would accumulate on the solar panels and that would uh, block out the ability of the rover to get light. And it would just, like, as soon as the dust accumulated, it would be all over. But it turns out that the Martian dust uh, doesn't stick well to the solar panels which is great so when there is a dust storm when a lot of dust falls it does indeed cover the solar panels but then later when there's wind without dust which also happens Mm. it blows all the dust off so the good news is that there is a like a wind without dust event on its way uh, and from our understanding of Martian weather. So this is sort of the last hope that like maybe Opportunity hasn't checked in because it's covered in dust and it needs to get its panels blown off. And it, once that happens, there will be uh, enough light to restart the operating system, to restart the software and recharge the batteries. Um, so this, uh, this dust clearing season occurs in the November, November to January time frame, and it's helped clean rovers panels in the past. And so hoping that that's what's going to happen. And maybe that that's sort of like the last chance that there's, there's a, a problem that is to do with, uh, the dust rather than a problem to do with the rover. So you're saying there's a chance. I'm saying there's a chance. I love it. I, how amazing would it be in a rover's life that has already been marked by so many moments of joy and celebration for everyone, including definitely me, to have written that thing off and boom, it comes back online. That's right. Amazing. That it would be, be amazing. It'd be a it's good It's probably story, not going to happen, but it'd be a great story. It'd be like a weird movie. Like a really weird movie, but it would have a great ending. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just ends with it just ends with a beep, and and then everybody going bonkers, you know, like they're in like a mission control somewhere, and and yeah. it's just total silence. They're just working, and there's like a beep, and then everybody's just like, "Whoa, my God, is back!" End of movie. End of movie. I mean, that's that's why that's why I'm a Hollywood producer, Hank. It, the news from AFC Wimbledon is uh, not great not great played um portsmouth over the weekend portsmouth's one of the best teams in league one they're fan owned which is great actually they used afc wimbledon as a model for saving their club when they went bankrupt they were in the premier league they went completely bankrupt they fell all the way down to league two it was a disaster um but they're a really big club i think they have like fifteen thousand season ticket holders they have a big stadium uh, and they used kind of the wimbledon model as as many clubs have in england to figure out how uh they were going to be able to hold on to their team and uh you know keep keep a football club in their community and so that's great that, they, that Wimbledon have been helpful to them in that way. It's always good to see clubs owned by their fans. Unfortunately, Portsmouth, big club, big stadium, lots of fans, lots of money uh, relative to us, and uh, they beat us. They beat us 2-1. I will say I watched the first half of the game, and I was completely despairing, looked absolutely hopeless. And then 
Neil Ardley did a fascinating thing, Hank. He made all three substitutions all at once hmm. at halftime, which is very rare. I do it all the time in FIFA, but it's very rare in proper <laughs> football. Um, very rare. And I will say Wimbledon played much, much better in the second half. James Hansen scored a goal in the 63rd minute to make it 2-1. Uh, we're never able to get back on level terms, but, you know, by the stats, it was a pretty close game. And it actually made me much more hopeful than any of our previous games or our last like four or five games have uh, when we've just looked clueless and without any ideas and without any quality uh, to finish uh, off goals in in the final third. So in that sense, I feel a little bit better than I did last week, but Wimbledon are still just one place out of the relegation zone. We've only won three of our first 13 games this season. Um, that is not great. So uh, hopefully we will remember this as an inflection point when, you know, the young, it it was, it was two uh, products of AFC Wimbledon's Academy, like uh, of the youth squad that came into the game and did really light it up. Anthony Hardigan, especially, uh, who's a central midfielder with a ton of potential. He was great. And uh, I really hope we see more of him in the future. But yeah, the news is not good at the moment, but uh, we are only, you know, one-fifth of the way into the season, mm-hmm. so there's a long way to go. Well, uh, frankly, compared to your previous reports, that sounded, like, very positive. Uh, I feel more positive after this loss than I felt after previous losses, although that is not <clears throat> that positive. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Hank, thank you for potting with me, and thanks to everybody for listening. We're now off to record our Patreon-only podcast this week in Ryan's. It is the worst podcast you could possibly pay for. <laughs> it's true. It's true. This podcast is edited by Nicholas Jenkins. It's produced by Rosiana Halser-Rojas and Sheridan Gibson. Our head of community and communications is Victoria Bongiorno. The music you're listening to now and at the beginning of the podcast is by the great Gunnarola. And as they say in our hometown, don't, don't forget, forget to be, be awesome. awesome.